I, I'm walking just the same, you know, it didn't, didn't make it worse. That's good. You know, so I don't know how long physical therapy takes, but uh, I think this is my fourth week. And every day it's a little better. Yeah, well, let's head in the right direction. All right, looks like we're live. And uh, we are live and we are joined this hour by uh, Roberto Cindy Rodriguez. Very, very excited uh, to be talking today about his book right here. Um, Yonki, a warrior summoned from the spirit world, testimonials on violence. So this is actually a really, really excellent book that I've had the pleasure of, uh, of uh, recently reading. Um, this is a DAW Center for the Arts uh, presentation, as well as uh, going to the archives of the University of Florida. So uh, we thank you for joining us. Um, so Roberto, let's just, uh, I know I know we're going to do a kind of a split thing where we're going to discuss each other's books, but let's start right, with right. yours. Uh, can you tell us about where the, uh, the title uh, of this book came from? Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of my work is split in three different directions. One of them has to do with corn or maize. And so my previous book, was called Sacred Maize. Our Sacred Maize is our mother. When I was finishing up that book, I ran across a codex that spoke about Yolki warriors, how when they would battle, they would summon Yolki warriors from the spirit world to come fight in this world. And I remember when I came across it, I said, damn, I go, that's going to be the title of my next book. And so, yeah, I wrote it down and kept the codex. And, um, uh, yeah, so what it, what it literally means is that when a Yolki warrior is a warrior that lives in the spirit world and comes to fight in this world. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, her name's Tanya, she says that we're all Yolki warriors, you know, that we all have that in us. But for me, it's very specific, you know. That is the reason I wrote it and, and applied it is because when I was almost killed by cops in, in East LA on Whittier Boulevard, that was 1979, my skull was fractured. And when that happened, I was unconscious, but I wasn't aware that I was unconscious. I remember coming back to consciousness. And again, I wasn't aware that I was not in, that I was not conscious. All I remember is that I was back and there was a cop behind me screaming at me, but I could barely hear him. He sounded like a mouse, but he was screaming, you know, and uh, telling me to give him my arm so he could handcuff me. And, uh, Anyway, to make a long story short, that I figured it out later that I had been unconscious. You know, it wasn't like, uh, yeah, but I would, had no way of knowing at the time. So when I learned about that concept about being summoned from the spirit world and I applied it to myself, I said, the only thing that's missing is that somebody has to summons them, you know, somebody has to summons a warrior. So I thought to myself, well, who summons me? And then I thought to myself, well, I summons myself, you know, in other words, I wasn't ready to go. So that, so it was me. And, uh, and it feels like it's, I feel real good about that idea because, you know, when even if you've ever met anybody who's lost somebody to, to law enforcement violence, I mean, it is tough. You know, somebody has been tortured. I'm a member of two organizations. One is the survivors of torture and political violence. I mean, that's when you're talking about heavy trauma, et cetera. Same thing with survivors of like somebody's brother was killed, somebody's mother or somebody's father was killed. They live with heavy trauma. And uh, I, I, di I didn't want to be what I had become already. That is somebody like that, that, you know, it's like it's heavy stuff. And it, uh, it makes you relive trauma whenever you're dealing with the topic. So I didn't want to do that. So when that concept came back, came to me, I felt good about that, you know, like I'm a warrior instead of simply I'm a survivor, you know, I'm a, I'm a warrior. And uh, I'll tell you, it's, um, I mean, I've been battling police brutality almost like 50 years. On my case, I mean, technically you could say like 41 years because that's when it happened. But I, was, I remember the riots from the cops, you know, when they attacked students at Garfield and Roosevelt, that was in 68 and then 70 when the cops attacked the people, you know, it was right down the street from where I grew up. So I've had that, my whole life has been that, but but precisely with me, it's 41 years. And regardless if I'm a warrior or not, et cetera, I mean, it does get a little tiring, you know, to like the mind always being there battling nonstop. That's yeah. why I'm proud of someone like yourself and all, a lot of the, the, the young people that are part of those other organizations called Justice Families. They're about your age, more or less. 
they're mostly youngsters, you know? I mean, you know, there's a range. So from like mid twenties to like mid thirties and you know, there's a few that are older, but it's awesome because like, sometimes you feel like you're battling alone. And a lot of times we did battle alone, you know, the different people that would fight. But now it's like, it's like, there's a different, there's different movements. And one of them are the families themselves, you know, cause they say, they talk about, uh, about being part of a club that nobody wants to be a part of, you know? Yeah. You, you mentioned this happened in, uh, in 1979. Yeah. At the time you were you were uh, you were kind of you were a journalist. You were yeah. you were you were taking photography for uh, for a journal. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how um, at that time, you know, the seventies, um, and to this day, but like, but but really in the seventies, how the police were targeting uh, journalists. Oh yeah. You still did. Right. Except yeah, th that happened. But you know what happened with me specifically? I was actually writing a story about police brutality, yeah, and it, it coincided with the whole Zutsu thing. See, Zutsu was about mass dragnets, you know, about one person. Yeah, one person committing a crime and then getting hundreds of people arrested, you know, in a mass dragnet. And so that was happening, that play was happening when I was working for Lowrider. And I remember thinking, I would always hear stories from the different voters. They would say, like, they'd say, like, oh, yeah, you know what? They, they got 30 of us and send us to jail. We spend the night there. I go, for what? I go, I don't know, somebody tagged the wall and they couldn't find him, so they took us off. In other words, it was constant. There was like about, I don't know how many, but I know I wrote about 30 of them. And that came out in the issue after what happened to me. Uh, I think it was called Los Barrios del Sur. I don't even know if that was my title, but that's how it came out. But yeah, so that's what I was doing. I was, I was writing about all these mass arrests. And then, so when I went out there that night, it was the, the opening night of a movie. Boulevard Nights. And uh, so I, and I did function as a journalist. I mean, cause that's, again, I, I literally lived down the street. A lot of them are my neighbors. A lot of them are friends cause they knew I was with the magazine and all of that. But, so I wasn't simply like out there to have a good time, uh, which, you know, to me it was a good time but it was literally uh, an assignment. I was covering it. And that's when uh, some youngster with a sarape started talking about God and Cops came, chased them, beat the crap out of him, vicious. And, uh, you know, I, I sensing danger. I said to myself, I, I'm leaving, you know, I'm not going to stay here. And so again, my neighbors and, and a few friends from the magazine, the people knew me, they looked at me and they're like, hey, isn't that your job? And I look at them like, yeah, it's my job. But I go, but I'm not crazy. I'm not going to get killed. And uh, so by the, so I went to my car to get out of there. By the time I got to my car, there was no more noise because before it was him simply screaming about God, you know. When I got to my car, no more, no more of that. The only thing you could hear was the weco sound of the riot sticks hitting his body. And I'm like, I can't leave. I went back, took photos, and then that's when they got me. Yeah. There, there was a few other cases in that, in that era, but and you know, when in my arrest report, it said that I was the leader of ten to 15, a gang of ten to fifteen Mexicans, yeah? and that we were trying to rescue our brother. <laughs> and what you know what it was is the guy's literal brother was there, pleading for his life, his his brother's life. So they they messed it all up. But yeah, so it was an act. I mean, it's beyond censorship, you know, so retaliation. I guess you could call it repression. Yeah. But you know, that's for me, that's so long ago. And what, I, what I'm what i proud about it and about those days is that I did not give up. I went to court and I beat them twice, you know? Yeah. Now Nowadays, I like to concentrate on all the cases that have happened since, especially the last five years, you know? But right, otherwise, right. Is, for me, otherwise, it's mostly just nostalgia, you know? I understood, understood. Um, what I was going to say, I just wanted to like put it in the context that this was a time where it wasn't just that you were there. There were also like the, the fact that you had a camera. Yeah. Exactly. The target. So, like, you know, you, you, you actually speak a little bit about uh, in this, and, I, and we'll move to the present, but you also speak about, um, you know, like a lot of the stories around Ruben Salazar as to whether yes. or not his death was, was um, as they reported to have been, a, you know, a tragic accident, but as actually more likely a target coordinated uh, hit. I, a lot of us believe that. I believe that. And I think most of the people around that, that era, that time, do believe that. The mom, she used to say, a mi hijo lo eliminaron, you know? It wasn't accidental. I, you know, I, I ran into some 
guy who claimed to be ex-army intelligence. I, I met him about five years after that. And he sounded like, uh, not like dementia, but maybe close to it. But he, you know, he, we ran into him at a swap meet. We, we were like the newspaper, you know? Mm -hmm. And he was talking about that we didn't know what we were talking about, you know? And then, he, and then we're talking, we're looking at him like, what are you talking about? That guy, Salazar, you guys think that he got killed by the, by the projectile? Because no, that was a hit, you know? That goes, it was army intelligence, you know? It was military intelligence. It took him out because we had two people inside, took him out. And, you know, of course, me and my girlfriend at the time, we, we couldn't stop laughing probably for like five years. I mean, we thought it was funny, but later on, uh, and then I'll make it as short as I can, but when Raul, I mean, uh, when uh, Mike, uh, Mario Garcia wrote a book on Salazar, mm -hmm. I told this little episode to the, the author, and he says, you should talk to Raul Ruiz, because he never believed that that uh, he was killed by the projectile. Because you know what this uh, in military intelligence guy said? He says, look, were you at the funeral? And I said, no, I was in high school. I was, uh, I was in school. Goes, but I go, but I did watch it on television. And he says, well, do you remember seeing his face, his head? I go, yeah. Because how could he have his head intact if he got shot by a nine inch armor piercing projectile? This is, there's no way his head would have remained intact. Yeah. And that's what I told Raul. And Raul says, yeah, I that's what I've always believed, that it was not. He said, the military guy, he says that they took him out. The, there was somebody right literally behind him, came up to Salazar and blew his head off. He said the gas simply was a, a good cover for them. But that was the plan all along. Whether I believe it or not, I, I all I know is that I think as a community, we, we believed it. Because it was it was not accidental that the only voice that we had was taken out by whatever means, you know, it was done. Right. So you, you, you mentioned also uh, wanting to talk about more recent cases, um, but there's a kind of the context of some of the more recent cases to talk about. I mean, I think, I think it's really important is when we look at these statistics, we see the disparities and how, and, and, and at the rate of, of murder uh, of uh, at the hands of police um, by, by, you know, three basic communities, right? The, the communities that are labeled uh, yeah, African -American, yeah, Black and brown, yeah. Yeah, Native American, and then the group known as Latinos, right? Yes. But you, in your book, report that there is largely likely a massive undercount yeah. of this group of people known as Latinos because the census obviously categorizes them as white, and that creates this kind of weird little trick where, like, people experience poverty, people experience this, people experience this, but, but their, their, their statistics get all smudged, yeah. right? Yeah. Because, yeah. because of kind of white smudging. So can you speak a little bit to how sure. that, that, that smudging ends up with these statistics yeah. on, on the rate of a police murder. Oh yeah, and let me go back real quick about one thing real quick. And that's that uh, to me, the past, present and future is all the same to me, you know? But I did want to make sure that I didn't stay with, the, with my thing only, you know? But definitely. Um, yeah, regarding the statistics, it's like what you're saying. See, the Washington Post right now uh, for about five years has kept tallies on who gets killed killedbypolice.net, before it was The Guardian, you know, The Guardian, and they had a project called Accounted. Anyway, it was great. But right now, like Washington Post is probably the best you can get, and then killedbypolice.net. Washington Post has five racial categories, uh, white, black, Hispanic, maybe slash Latino, and then uh, unknown and other. And uh, so, you know, when you have Hispanic, Latino, you're going to think, oh, that's probably where most of the brown people go, you know? You know, somebody named Sanchez, it's like, oh, even if they don't talk to him because they're dead, right? So I'm, I'm sure that's a Hispanic, uh, Jesse Garcia. Oh, yeah. Well, what happens is like what you alluded to in Texas, when they do statistics there and they arrest somebody, the person named Sanchez is going to end up in the white category. So when you look at the entire country, it's like it's like the coronavirus thing. In other words, everybody's got different rules and all that. So you're not going to get because I. I'll tell you what, what I'm getting to. By mistake or by curiosity, I looked into the unknown category. And that's when I, I saw Garcia, Sanchez, Dominguez, Rodriguez. And I'm like, wait a minute, unknown? You know, how could Garcia be unknown? Whether it's a good label or not, that's, if we're using those labels, that's Garcia belongs in the, the Hispanic Latino category. So then I said, I wonder if there are any more Garcias in other categories, you know? And I checked every category and sure enough, the one that probably had the least was the black category, but there was still some. But I went into the white category and there was quite a few in them. 
So you had the white category, then you had the unknown category, and then you have the other. Other, they usually put native people and Asian people in that category for the most part. But there's another category that they never talk about, and that one's called unidentified. Meaning, in other words, they can't even know who it was, male, female, name, nothing. So, I mean, most of the people killed are, are men, you know, young men or young boys of color. It's like 95%. So the issue is when you add up the unknowns and you add up all the Garcias in the white category, the, I estimate between 20 to 33% undercount. So if you tally everything up every year, this is what I've tallied up. From the time, from 2014, the year Michael Brown was killed, you have 6,500 people killed since Michael Brown. And of that total, I estimate between 1,200 to 1,400 Raza. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm definitely interested in that math, but like what, what, what's interesting to me that has always appeared as an anomaly yeah. is that when we see these, um, we see these statistics on the counter or this or that, We'll see like you know rate of killing per per like million or something like that, and it'll say like African American seven point two, yeah. Native American eight point three, or some year six point two, whatever. It'll it'll go down to that. Right, right. Down to the Hispanic area, the Latino Hispanic, whatever category, and it'll say like four point one or something like that, and then white yeah. will be like two. So it'll be more than white, but not like as drastic mm -hmm. drastic as the other two. Yet and yet the places that have the the most killingest counties of all tend to be Kern County. Like you know, like like Bakersfield area, yeah. uh, in New Mexico, um, and all these areas that are, have like a lot of rasa, right? That that, that the most significant population. If right, anyone's right. gonna get shot there, it would mostly be rasa. And then and yet, how do these national numbers work if that's the case? Like the 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 the, the, the most brutal, murderous counties being in New Mexico, being in like kind of Central Valley, being here, being there, being in these places where there's like these heavy Mexican populations, and yet somehow that 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 math was always fuzzy to me. Like that doesn't well, make sense. It's a combination. Yeah. So that's why the numbers are important because in other words, we are at a higher at a higher rate than we should be in terms of how they count. But also, it's, it's the national media. Because look, um, I, if I were to just look at the state by itself, because you know how, how many how much Rasa is in, uh, in in California? About twelve million. It's like way up there, right? Um, so California is the number one state in the entire country in terms of killings, right? Uh, number two, it's not even close, but number two is Texas, you know? Number three is Florida. Number four is either New Mexico, Nevada, Arizona, Colorado. In other words, in that order. So the highest rates of killing are east of the, or west of the Mississippi. So who lives in those states? Well, obviously we do, you know, uh, brown people do. But so when you total it all up, to me, that's why I say it's red, black, and brown. It doesn't matter the order. That is, we've been getting killed from, since 1492 to the present. That's how I look at it. Other people want to look at it a different way they can. But to me, I look at and I part of what I was telling you at the beginning, what, what, what happened to me, I went forward and backwards in terms of killings. And I could not find a time when it was better. Because the 60s, you went to the 50s, the 40s, you know, due to uh, Bloody Christmas, all that stuff. You went to the 30s, all of a sudden you got lynchings lynchings against Mexicanos that most people don't know about, against Chinese, against Native Americans, and obviously African Americans. So that was the whole era, the whole Jim Crow era, you know, a good hundred years. And then prior to that, what do we got? But 300 years of colonialism, you know? So I'm like, wait, we never had a honeymoon here. <laughs> we never, there was never a time where it was peaceful, et cetera. And then you go in this direction. I mean, God, all you have to, yeah, look at the statistics and they're not good at all. Yeah. People can play games with numbers, you know, back in, you know, one way or another way. But when you total it up, look, LA County, for example, because I've seen the reports and yeah, they'll say like, ah, but you know, you're, you know, you're 58% of all the killings, but you're 45% of the population. So that's not really an anomaly. And I'm like, what the hell are they talking about? In other words, if they kill 10,000, it's like, as long as we're proportionate, it's okay. But no. <laughs> you know, one is one too many. Right. And, if, and so that's the point. It's like we've gotten normalized with like it has to be out of proportion. Forget that. We are out of proportion, yeah. you know, as you know. Right. It's, it just seems to me like the, the, the academic trends right now is to talk about 
uh, people having a move towards whiteness or proximity towards whiteness, yeah. next generation, the Mexicans will be white. That's a very trendy thing to say in the academy. But this, this, this kind of question of um, this kind of this, I don't know how to describe it, this like white on paper thing has always been a tool against Chicano people or, or, or you know, Mex Mexicans living in America. Because um, if you look at like, um, mm, let's take Mendez versus Westminster, it was like, you can't sue us because you're white. Like, you, you can't come to school with us, but you can't sue us because you're white. So there's nothing happened here, right? There's no discrimination. Uh, you look at Hernandez versus Texas when they when they sued to get the to get a jury of your peers, right? right well, right. what are you talking about? You guys are white. Of course, no Mexican can be on a jury, but you guys are white, right? Like, so like, it's always kind of th this has always been a tool against us. It's never been something that like was benefit. It's never been a benefit. It's never been a beneficial yeah. move. It was never something granted by the state to be like hey, you guys are all right. It's it's always yeah. it's always been a, a battering ram against uh, struggle. Do you, do you know the scholar Martha Menchaca? Tell me. Okay, Martha Menchaca wrote a book and wrote precisely on the topic you just raised. And she says that, that there were in fact some Latinos or Mexican or Mexican Americans that passed for white, but the number was so tiny, you know? In other words, like 95% of us were not passing for white and 95% of us were being treated less than human, you know? So, so this notion of that somehow we were white was all on paper because that's why you had Mexican schools. That's why you had segregation, theater, restaurants, you know, and on and on and on. Uh, but, you know, I, I am very familiar with the topic you're talking about. It's, it's bizarre because number one, it's ahistorical, that's the main thing. But people, see, people think like, okay, so we have Black Lives Matter, okay? So that's kind of the dynamic, right? That the struggle against racism, the struggle against brutality, you know, we're like natural allies because that happens to us too. But people that don't know that it happens to us too, it's almost like your job is to be a supporter and kind of like, well, wait a minute, not just a supporter, we're part of that too, you know? And then people, instead of saying, well, what do you mean? And then if you bring out the numbers and all that, then all of a sudden we're talking as co-equals, you know? But instead, what I hear, which we're alluding to, is like, well, you guys are actually racist, you know? And so you need to overcome your racism and so you can support us. It's kind of like, well, of course. I mean, we have that within us. In fact, a lot of us suffer from that precise attitude, et cetera. But you can do two things at the same time. That is fight that and also fight for ourselves because right. we are, like I said, we're part of those three communities. You know, we're not bystanders. We're not spectators, you know? We, those things are happening to us and have always happened to us, yeah. So I don't know if that's kind of where you were no, going. Absolutely. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just going by what, what, what's in the book, the chapter, uh, neither black nor white. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I really think that that's absolutely true. I think that, I think what gets lost with the next year, with the, with, we're not doing a good job of transmitting information. I mean, when I say we, I don't mean you and I, I mean, you yeah, and I, yeah. we can, but like uh, overall, um, not doing the best job. Well, more, there's more people need to get involved in doing this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We need to be a better, um, Better conduit of information to the, the to, to the further generations and to and to um, recreate the mm. thing because a lot of people are just very historical talking about like um, that we don't have a history we don't have a movement or that we only resisted because we saw someone else doing it nobody resists if they don't have something to resist nobody like that in, in human history nobody nobody's going to resist conditions that don't exist <laughs> people resist because they're being oppressed you know yeah. and we have our own history and trajectory of of, of fighting back you know as does as do all oppressed people around the world, you know? Well, you know, and what I like about that is that, you know, when I started studying this topic, uh, they used to talk about this country being very stable, you know, democracy, you know, all that. In Latin America, they called it unstable, right? And I thought to myself, I was trying to figure out what they meant by that, right? So when I began to study, literally what they were talking about, the history of rebellions, you know, like every country south of the U.S. has rebelled nonstop since 1492. And I said, oh, I get it. In other words, our peoples were rebelling all the time, you know, resisting. Yeah. And they call that instability. In other words, we're supposed to be happy. Like, oh, yeah, we love your oppression and we're okay with it. So people never were okay with it. That's why people minimize what, it, what colonization is, what it was, you know. But yeah, no, absolutely. You can't ignore the, the rebellion, that we are part of a rebellion. 
I, I think we're still in it. What I love, what I love about your book though, is, is the scope of history. It starts off with the with the, the that horrible incident that you experienced, but then it moves, you know, into the 1400s and it moves back to today. Um, just the size and scope of you know, like pinpointing, like, well, where does this begin, right? I, I really I really admire that. Um, one of the other things I really admire about your book is that you actually uh, gave a section of it uh, to other people. There's a collection of essays in here. In the middle of the book, it breaks out into essays from different people. So how did you go about collecting those essays? Well, you know, as I mentioned, since 79, it's like I had to, you know, it was not an option. And I've been aware as to who it affects. And so sometimes I've actually been lectured by three different people. I'm not even going to mention the race or whatever, but they're not black. Absolutely not but telling me, you know, what I'm supposed to write about, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, you know what? I've lived this stuff, you know? And on top of that, I've researched it, you know? So like on two levels. And so for me, knowing the, the resistance that exists in the country, and I primarily went to these three communities, you know, indigenous, black and brown. And so I have stuff from each community. Uh, because to me, I'm not going to pretend or say, well, you know what, they're ignoring us, so I'm just going to do us. I said, well, wait a minute, why don't you set the example, you know, how to do it. So that's why I said, I'm going to get indigenous peoples. And, and, you know, some of us are mixed with all three, <laughs> some of us, you know, some of us are just one, but, you know, that's how, that's how life is. Some of us are mixed. So uh, I did get, you know, peoples from African-American community, peoples from native communities, uh, you know, there's a journalist by the name of Simon. Uh, I'm forgetting his last name right now, but Moya, Moya Smith, Simon Moya Smith, excellent writer. On the topic, he wrote something. Laurie Valdez, her uh, husband was killed up in San Jose. She wrote. You know, I so I, I've been monitoring all you know all these years. That's why I can tell almost every year how many people get killed. You know how they hide, so to, all that stuff. So I wanted to just get people to speak for themselves. So most of the people that wrote were people who lived it one way or another. I think Simon was like myself, you know, that is we've, we've written about it. I mean, I've lived it too, but I, but I also write about it. Yeah. And then I think there was an African-American woman who also uh, more of an activist, you know? You know, there's kind of a, I wouldn't call it a controversy, but it, there is a sense from the families that have lived through this, they, they, there's a sense amongst them that they don't get the mic, you know? That is, that they don't, that other people speak for them, you know? And so I wanted to make sure that they were represented also. Because they say, you know what, a lot of them, they fight and fight, but we know even more, you know? That is, we've, we're living this pain and we get left out of the conversation all the time. So that was part of what I wanted to do, you know, get family members. You know, if I could, I probably would do another book, you know, of simply testimonies. And, you know, it's, you know, one of the things that I started to do and I'm beginning to do is create an archives project. And literally just 20, 2014 to the present. Because, you know, with what's happening today, like, I don't believe in reforms, just like I don't believe in the judicial system, I don't believe in the political system. So I don't think reform is gonna do anything. But I'm saying, but we live in this society. So I said, well, if that's what they're gonna fight for, there is one reform that I would be, that I would be good with, and that's no statute of limitations. You know, that is right now, because a lot of the people, they can't, they can't criminally prosecute them, the cops. There's a deadline, you know, you gotta do it within a year. You can't file a lawsuit unless you also make a claim within a year. A lot of times lawyers are part of this. And like, I'll give you one example, Luis Rodriguez, his wife filmed his killing and she's right there as they're killing him in front of her. You know, they did not prosecute any of the five officers. They choked him to death. His last words were, I can't breathe. And that was three months before Eric Garner. Afterwards, she sued but was disqualified from suing. And I'm like, what kind of crap is that? You know, that, that was 2014. There's no, there's no statute, statute of limitations on murder. So I look at it, if there's no statute of limitations on murder, then there should be no statute of limitations for police abuse. You know, so, cause I'm, I'm thinking that that was a crime that she couldn't even sue, you know? 
So that's what I'm for, you know, yeah. eliminating that statute of limitation. Because, you know, if you, if you take a look at all the, all the, uh, the reforms that people are proposing, I mean, imagine you're a cop, somebody, you see somebody pointing something at you, you shoot them, and you find out it was a cell phone. So what happens? You tell the, the your, you know, the, in your report, well, I saw what I thought was a gun. He can never get convicted on that because he thought the cell phone was a gun. I'm like, you know, what reform is going to fix that? Yeah. You know what I, what I believe? Those same three communities that I'm talking about, it's a colonial relationship we have. We're unwanted and we're viewed as less than human. Unless that is changed, there ain't going to be no reform. And that domination is going to remain. And the... the See, police abuse, what it is, it's a system of control. It's like in the old days, you know, you had a newspaper, you hit a dog on the, on the nose, you know, you only have to do it once. Second time, you just raise the newspaper and that dog knows what to do or what not to do. That's how the, the police function in our communities, you know, although they do a lot more violence than just once, you know, but that's, but you know, they could kill a million people, but they don't need to kill a million people. They just have to kill a few, brutalize a few, and keep those communities in check. You you patrol their bodies and you patrol communities. That's that's the relationship we have. And unless that's altered, those reforms. Look what happened after Rodney King. There was the Christopher Commission after Rodney King, after uh, Michael Brown. Everybody's always talking about reforms. What happens? Nothing. You know, maybe a year of you know talk. And maybe there's a little change, but for the most part, why are we having more killings now than before when Rodney King was around? Yeah. Hey, we're talking too much about my book, huh? Why don't you throw in about yours? All right, uh, all right. well, we're, we're at the halfway mark. I mean, you want, you want to... Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, maybe you could do the same, because I know people have asked about, like, why did you call your book Mowing, Mowing Leaves of Grass? With, well, I think that's Carl Marx back there, right? No, that's, Walt, that's Walt Whitman getting his face ripped up. Um, and it's called, <laughs> it's called Mowing Leaves of Grass because he was, uh, Walt Whitman was a uh, proponent of the Mexican-American War and Manifest Destiny more broadly. Uh, Walt Whitman um, actually wrote in a newspaper and he said, uh, what is miserable and inefficient Mexico with her burlesque upon liberty to do with the grand mission of peopling the new world with a noble race? And so that was his, what he was speaking in favor of, of Mexi uh, a war with Mexico. He also said, in the effect of like, you know, our patience has run dry with Mexico and that we should take it all the way to the Yucatan, right? So not only was he, not only was a proponent of the Mexican-American War and what happened, he was actually a proponent of, of, of the seizure of all of Mexico. Um, he also, in I believe in 1840, no, in 18, sometime in the early 1850s, wrote a poem called From the Palmanic Starting. And in From the Palmanic Starting, he talks about California, I will teach you this robust American love, right? And he's writing that during the gold rush. Right, so he's writing that time when Mexicans are being lynched, being being having their land, you know, having their like, farms or whatever stolen, and, and people just getting murdered um, during Anglo settlement, and uh, and yeah, and so this guy, that, that's who he was, right? So and uh, leaves of grass is kind of the most preeminent um, piece of American poetry, um, you know, just because I hate someone doesn't make me a hater. I mean, I recognize the 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 the, 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 the giant legacy this man has. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, if I'm gonna pick a fight, I'm gonna pick a fight with a, somebody good, right? So yeah. that's why I became, that's why I call it Mowing Leaves of Grass. Because um, the entire book is really about the browning of America or the rebrowning of America. Yeah. Well, you know that, I don't know if it was you that triggered this, but right now in popular culture, in, you know, in the national conversation, his name has come up for the same reason. Because, you know, people are talking about the statues, right? Yeah. And then they're saying like, hey, what about Walt Whitman, you know? And I'm, I, again, I don't know if that came from you, but he's definitely been, uh, people have been pointing towards him. Well, there was, there was critique of William before. I mean, the things he said about African-Americans also like, horrible. Um, things he said about, uh, you know, I guess what we call American Indian community were also terrible. So he said a lot of horrible things. Um, my yeah. particular, I have a particular focus on what he said about Mexico. And the reason I have that is because um, I'm Mexican. So like that. <laughs> well, Mexican. Ian, I was, was going to ask you something because you know it. I don't know that everybody knows it, but what you talked about the Yucatan. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the concept of uh, first uh, providence and then manifest destiny. And you could also link up the American dream, but also American exceptionalism. All of that really, the idea was to take over the entire America, the whole from North to South. 
The reason they didn't pursue is because they thought they it'd be like South Africa, you know, from the like 70s, 80s, all that, that it'd be like white people dominating the whole like 80% non-whites, you know? So they, I think they thought like, we'll take it over little by little, you know, right. because it, they didn't want to colonize the entire thing right then. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, one of the things that I find and because of the, what you told me, uh, well, my, my trajectory that I see 1492, I see colonialism, imperialism and on and on. That's what like for me, like almost everything in your book relates to how I see the world, you know? It all, it, you know, it's not accidental. That's why I say it's not about, for me, it's not about reforms, you know? But you, you were saying that your focus is the rebrowning of America. Is that what you're saying? The rebrowning of America, but, and also just the general, just, just general, you know, heading towards the point where there's not gonna, there's gonna be not as many Anglo, the, the, the proportion of Anglo-Americans is gonna be just much smaller. And they fear and anxiety uh, around that and the resulting in like Trump and the politics of Trump. Because even after Trump's gone, I mean, whether it be another four years, whether it be whatever, or there's some type of war, or there's going to be more Trumps because the, the, the politics that brought him forth uh, haven't gone anywhere. I mean, the fact of the matter is these numbers are changing. It's going to continue to produce more and more of these people saying Mexico's doing this and, oh my God, the Mexicans taking over. Oh my God, taco trucks. Oh my God. That's going to keep happening, right? And so this book is a, a kind of a declaration that it is going to happen. There's going to be a taco truck in every corner and, uh, and fuck you. Like, and that's that. And then, and, there's, and then there's no, it's, it's like proud. It's not like, oh, no, no, let me, let me ease your pain. Let me, let me make you feel more comfortable. It's no, you, you guys are you, you, brutal, murderous regime that has ruled over this continent for, uh, um, you know, for, for centuries. And uh, at least in this little Anglo part, it's going to get, uh, uh, maybe it's not going to be paradise or anything like that, but it's going to be a lot better than it was. And so like, you know, and that's going to happen. And uh, yeah. And that I mean, like that's 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 what the book's about. The book is about is about uh, is about the changing of demographics and and I mean, I, you know, there's still brutality, so it's, it it doesn't it doesn't pull back on any of that either. But it is about the changing of demographics, and it is about people's anxiety around that. And it's basically uh, telling you, "Fuck you for being anxious." I mean, like, and it's also and it's also a call for you know you know in the in the struggle for ethnic studies, there's this, this the, we act like it's also so complicated. You know, I mean, like, you know, if I go talk to someone at school, I'll ask them two quick questions. You know, what is the demographic of your student body? What are the demographics of your library? You know I'm saying, like, if I go in your library, what, what am I going to see versus the demographics here? Oh, I'm seeing, like, nothing but, like, white people books, uh, books written by white people, and I'm seeing that you, you got a school full of brown kids. This is colonialism. Like, that, <laughs> that's it. You know, like, and, that, and that's it. And so like, uh, it, it's a book about solving that. It's a book about fighting against that. It's a book about finding like, we need to stop looking up to Walt Whitman and, and people right. like Walt Whitman. Yeah. So, you, know, you know, living in Arizona, you know that like the, the battle of ethnic studies at the K through 12 level, you know, began here uh, and intensified in the, oh, two, about 2009 or so is when it kind of got heavy for about five years or so. But, um, I can tell even myself in high school, we couldn't even call ourselves Mecha, you know? We ended up with Sumac, you know? In other words, they objected to us stepping forward, defining ourselves. The battle for ethnic studies 50 years ago was as intense or even more so than what we dealt with in Arizona. So in other words, like, okay, so let's just take Arizona for, for example. There was no Trump in Arizona, you know? We had Horn, we had our Arpaio, we had Brewer. So that what that what you're talking about? You're right. It, it, it all it's been here since forever, and so this idiot that comes along, I think he the difference between him maybe is that he um, I'm trying to give a good analogy outside of the fact that he's into money, a bad businessman to boot, but uh, yeah, I don't even know how to describe the dude. But the point is, this would happen without him, you know. Oh, I, I know what I was getting at. Is I think he literally is missing a couple of screws, you know? And that's the difference. Because I think this guy probably would do the nuclear codes if he could, you know? Which is, you know, a good capitalist, they're gonna probably weigh the, weigh the numbers and say, it's not a good idea to blow up three fourths of the world, you know? A, a capitalist probably won't, but somebody like him, you know, his ego, his instability might. That's the only difference I see. Because again, we never battled Trump. You know, it was uh, Brewer and Arpaio and Horn and Hoopenthal, et cetera. 
So right. yeah, and it's always been there. But um, I, what, I think, what I think is unique is that, that he took it all the way to the presidency. I mean, like, if you look at, like, um, the his, history of, like, California with Prop 27 and, and like, uh, Wilson, or yeah. we're talking about Kyle more, more recently, or we're talking about Brewer, or, or any of these number of people, right? right, right. Um, that, that is, like, a regional thing, right? The idea that I'm going to, like, say Mexico is, you know, hide your kids, hide your wife, the Mexicans are coming kind of stuff, um, and I'm going to take that all the way to the White House, and I'm going to make that my central point and theme. That's kind of new, and I think that that could be tied to the fact of changing demographics. Like this question, which was once a regional thing because that's what the population was, has become national because it is threatening to upend the yeah. national demographics. And because it's threatening to upend the national demographics, there will be more. There'll be, there'll, there's going to be more. And so I think that's what we have to really like understand. Simultaneously, as this is reality, the reality of the situation, our growing numbers is, is, is pushing the politics in this direction. There is a push to not allow us to speak on it. You know what I'm saying? Like, remember El Paso when, when the, someone shot, someone shot 20 Mexicans and they were like, I'm going to go kill Mexicans. At, in the aftermath, why weren't you on television? Why wasn't like, let's say, Roberto Hernandez on television? Why was, why weren't there Mexicans or, or Chicanos or whoever, you know, like, you know, people coming on to talk well, about why, was why wasn't that happening? Yeah. Why are we not allowed on TV? Why are we not allowed on CNN? Well, they, part of it is they whitewashed it too. You know, in other words, they wanted it to be a healing thing. You know, for, forget race. It was not racially motivated. It was about, you know, we're, we're a nice community. We're going to be strong. Kind of like, like what you're saying, silencing the reality. That was a white supremacist. No, see, that's why to me, the ethnic studies has always been linked to what you're talking about. In other words, it's defining who we are. If we look at it in a smaller way, it's like, when, that's when we think of it like, oh, this is for Asians, this is for native people, this is, you know, smaller groups. But literally what's going on is, it's like the, what they talk about, the battle for the soul of this country. And that's what you see. See, and, and that's why the demographics are tied into it. It's almost like it doesn't matter the racial composition. The main idea has to remain, you know, providence, manifest destiny, American dream, American exceptionalism. So it doesn't matter if the troops are black or brown, <laughs> they go invading other nations, you know? It's just that the idea has to survive. That's why they, that's why they attack us. Most people, they only paid attention to the immigration, but it was both immigration and ethnic studies because it, that's precisely what it was. They want us, see, you know, I don't know if you know this specifically because most people, you know, I had to know this because it's, we're living here, we're battling this, but Hoopenthal and Horn they were okay with Raza studies if we taught it starting with Columbus. If, if, if our history books and Chicano studies began with Columbus, they were okay with that. But you see, my, like the, the work that I do about my East, 7,000 years, that's what they didn't want. They didn't want, see, because what does that mean, 1492 to the present? That's where you get the concept of whiteness, you know? At, or at best whiteness, I mean, because I guess you could throw in Mestizaki in there, but, but to them, they saw it like, uh, this, is, uh, this is their story, it begins with Columbus. But if we were to assert that, no, we have a history here on this continent for thousands and thousands of years, and we have admixture from all over the world, you know, we have a little bit from Africa, Asia, you know, and Europe, but our core is here thousands of years. They didn't want to hear that because they would say, no, that's Native American studies. They can teach that, but not you, you know? So that's actually what the battle was about. You know, uh, again, our story has to coincide with Columbus and the pilgrim. And we're like, wait a minute, we didn't do a east to west migration. No, I said, ours is north to south, thousands of years. And, you know, even then, see, our little kids were being taught that. Three-year-olds were being taught that. You know, that whole in La Quesh, it wasn't simply a poem. It, what they were being taught as a consciousness, you know, because everything that you're talking about in your book and now, it's like, it's like we understood that like what they were telling us is that we didn't belong here, you know? Yeah. And our response was absolutely we belong here. You know, we don't even have to go further, but if we wanted to go further, we would say, we belong, you don't belong, you know, you get on those ships and go back. But that wasn't part of what we taught. We simply taught we're from here and that's all, you know? It's them that didn't like that. You know, they didn't like us teaching that, you know? And I saw that with my own eyes, little three-year-olds, you know, three to, I think it's three to eight years old. They came in, 
in all these top scholars, you know, reciting in La Kesh, you know. It was awesome. Our, our battles were awesome. But part of it, I always tell people, but it wasn't like new. It was not a new thing because we did that 50 years before. But it's probably been happening forever. Do you know, do you know a guy named Francisco Martinez? He, he, he was a publisher of a publication called El Clamor Público in the late 40s, 1840s and 1850s. He was, he was battling the same idea then, you know? So I tell people, we didn't start battling in the 50s or 60s. Well, maybe we did, but the 1850s. The reality, at least for me, I always say, you know what? People always ask, when did Chicano movement start? I said, you know, when Columbus tried to land, he was met by a fusillade of arrows, you know? And so he couldn't land where he was going to land. I said, that's when it started, you know? Resistance from, that's, but that's not where our history began. Okay, our history began thousands of years ago. So, see, they want to create their narrative and they want us to accept their narrative. It's like, you know, our narrative could be whatever we want it to be. All people do that, you know? But it's like, no, it has to be their narrative, you know? And we don't want it. No. Like I said, that's what your book's about. Yeah, it's about, it's about creating narratives that are appropriate for, a, uh, for the population that's coming, man. Like, you know, and, and in my opinion about Walt Whitman was that he's very talented, but he's racist, you know, and, and I'm also very talented. And that's the kind of thing that really pisses people off when I say things like that. Like I say, like, well, yeah, well, was really talented. So am I. Um, whatever. Because, I mean, like, people get really caught up in the deification of, of anybody, right? And I, I think that when you start deifying, you start, like, mystifying, you know? And, like, writing is a skill, and it's a practice, and it's something that you can get really good at if you work hard at it. And that's, true so that's, part, that's partly why you're answering your own question right now. Like we, we're getting killed, we're getting brutalized everywhere by law enforcement, supremacists, military, whomever. Why don't they give us the mic? And the answer is they want us to subscribe to their narrative, you know? So they read your book, they probably would rather ban your book, you know? Just like they banned the books in, in Arizona. In other words, they don't want those views, you know? So that's the answer. Because our story goes contrary to their east to west narrative, you know? They always say that the original sin of this country was slavery. And I always say, absolutely. But there was actually a couple other sin, original sins even before that one, which was genocide and land theft and slavery, you know? Those are the, this country's original sins. And yeah. so they don't want to hear that, you see? They'll admit to the slavery part, but they don't want to hear about genocide or land theft because it, it, it makes this country illegitimate as a result. Yes. Yeah. So you have a statue still. <laughs> yeah. and, and they're so ridiculous. They don't know anything, man. Like I was talking to this, 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 this guy from the Midwest and he's this really respected historian. He's mm -hmm. a white guy, but he's a respected historian on, I don't know. Anyways, but like a uh, like labor historian. And I told him that like, you know, you can't really understand California if you don't understand the changing demographics of California. Mm -hmm. Like, and like, he like laughed at me. He thought that was funny. He thought I was being ridiculous. He thought I was overstating something. Because in his mind, California is the California liberal, like I'm the California kid, kind of like that, kind of like this like white surfer dude. But that's right. what he thinks California is. And it's like, you really don't understand, man. This, this is a state that voted for Nixon and Reagan. This is a state that voted for Pete Wilson. This is a state that um, you know, voted for Nixon and Reagan, not just governors, but a president both times. Um, and the only way to account for, for it, it's moving to the, I mean, like not that this means, not that this means everything, but the moving to the blue and coming to just all is because of the changing demographics like that is why that happened not because the white people got more decent over the years that's not what happened yeah. and so like but that's so obvious like that's just so obvious if you're not a racist i mean like why did orange county go blue i mean it doesn't change demographics that's just obvious it's not that you I mean this idea that like the, the state is somehow moving meaning like white people are getting more decent that's that's ridiculous that's ridiculous and yet that is the insistence of people who live in places like Chicago or New York, um, their insistence on looking at the national uh, view of the nation. And then they're the ones because they have, you know, uh, long histories, trajectories, uh, long standing relationships with, uh, with each other um, to shape the narrative of the nation as a whole. Yeah. Uh, and they insist upon this. And I keep saying this thing over and over and over again, you know, that um, the real grant is not Ellis Island. So you cannot, you cannot talk about the immigrants and be like, oh, this country was, was quote unquote immigrants and not name who these immigrants are 
And, uh, and, uh, but we all know what you mean by immigrants, because if you meant a different group of immigrants, you would say it in front, you say Laotian immigrants, you say Haitian immigrants. When you don't say the, when you say the immigrants, we know you're talking about Mexicans and Central Americans. I mean, we know that's what you mean. But like, you say, well, it's because you always hated immigrants. Look what happened to the Irish in the, in the 1800s. Look what happened to this, look what happened to this, what happened to this. And it's like, you, there is no new Irish. The Irish are the Irish. <laughs> you know, the Mexicans are the Mexicans. Like, people are who they are. And yeah. like, the, the inability to allow that to be, they won't let they won't they won't let this shape the national narrative they just they cannot because the question land yeah yeah and 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 also that idea about who who belongs you know in their eyes we don't belong here see the see the the way their narrative works that they can accept the black and white narrative because they atone for their sins if they can you know but when you when you bring in the native you know the story the indigenous and the brown story, all of a sudden you, it, it diverts radically from that narrative. And they can't, they, it doesn't compute. It's called cognitive dissonance. In other words, this country is founded upon genocide and land theft, you know? And that, in other words, they can't, they're not prepared to discuss that with, I guess they want to protect K through 16 or something, you know? Because like, that's why the whole, all the whole monument stuff, that's their story, these little monuments. And, and it just goes against uh, that narrative. Um, I, and it's hard, I think it's hard for people that don't know, because remember when we go back to the issue of police brutality, if I tell you that the most killings in any state in the country, it's California, and it's not even close. There's no state that's even close to California. Who lives in California? You know, if you don't know, it's like, oh, uh, like what you're saying, they have this idea that surfers live there or something, you know? But no, uh, there's California and Texas and all the other Midwestern, uh, Southwestern states. And a lot of times, you know, it's like we get put into the other category. Not, not like the concept of the other, but literally in the other category or in the unknown category. And we, then we don't have to be named, you know? It's just like, well, yeah, you know, it's like people of color and, you know, maybe some others. And, yeah, so we're in that, that place. And, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable because we weren't there during my era when I was in college, if, you know, uh, like the early uh, 70s, that we fought together, you know, the, the different groups fought together. It's almost like that has been forgotten. And yeah. now we're best a footnote, maybe, you know, or allies, you know? yeah. I said, no, no, we're not allies, we're comrades, you know? Right. But there's always this weird thing to like fold, fold the history and to like make it a smaller sub chapter than it really is. Like I remember hearing like, you know, like uh, like the Mexican American war is fought because the slave drivers wanted more land. And so it's really, it's really a precursor to civil war and it's really kind of a chapter of the civil war and that's why it's there. Are you kidding me? You, you think the slave dollars are the only ones that wanted land? I mean, like you, the, 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 the Northern industrials didn't want land too. Are, are you serious? Like, you know, they were like, no, don't take that land. That's wrong. It's wrong, take land. Right, the, 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 you know, the westward expansion, like, you know, like Rockefeller and Carnegie and, and the railroad men, they, they didn't want land. I mean, the people that were fighting the slave drivers, you think they didn't want land? Are you, are you serious? And if you look at like actually the quote, heroes of the Mexican-American War, you're looking at Ulysses S. Grant, you're looking at Jefferson Davis, you're looking at, um, you're looking at both sides of the Civil War. Yeah. Both sides of the Civil War fought in the Mexican-American War. And so like, um, you know, people that would make up the Union, people would make up the Confederacy. The leaders of the Confederacy and the leaders of the Union both fought in, in, in the Mexican-American War to take land from Mexico. That, that's the fact. And so like, it, it's its own history. It has its own trajectory. Yes, it's interconnected. Of course it's interconnected. Of course there are, are, are threads that, 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 are, that are tied together like that. They're tied together like that. But to say that one thing collapses into another is to say that this thing is insignificant. Right, the Mexican-American right. War is insignificant. You know, like, stop talking about that. It's insignificant. Donald Trump said Mexico saying drug dealers and rapists, that's insignificant. What's really significant is that white people in the Midwest have been abandoned by industry. That's what's significant. What's really significant is that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and so like that, the insignificance of, no. of, of, of Chicano struggle is reiterated over and over and over again. The insignificance of the oppression of Mexicans in America is, is, is reiterated over and over and over again. You have a silencing and an invisibilization. Yes. You know, and you see, for me, the way I do this, the way I counteract that is I, I, uh, my opponent becomes the media, you know? I don't go after an organization or a movement, et cetera. I said, you know, we don't need to do that. The most, you know, the ones that have the knowledge and the history and the good analysis, they know. 
but not there's not a lot of those, so to speak, you know. So I'm not going to bother with there. Well, where my principal battle has to be is with the media, because if the media is teaching or failing to act, I mean that's where we have to battle, so that they know. Because like I said, just just what I mentioned about California, because you know even myself with all this research, I used to think all the police brutality, the big big stuff was going on in St. Louis, Cleveland, you know New York, New Jersey, you know. I thought, damn, man, they're, they're doing some weird shit over there. Turns out that it's California, you know, San Jose, Sacramento, Bakersfield, LA, San Diego, on and on and on. And like, who do you think lives there? But so that what you're saying, you know, you keep that out of the news, you, you silence and you invisibilize. Yeah. So in the end, see, I, I think it's very strategic because if all of a sudden you have brown people conscious of that, then all of a sudden it's like, oh shit. And then native, it's like, you know what? They don't want that. They'd rather have it a much simpler. And well, you know, we'll give them a reform here and a reform there and everything's good. But I, I don't know, like I said, you know, I, I know people, they get amazed because I remember getting hit up big time when I would present, they would say like, I, cause I would tell them, I don't believe in the judicial system. And they would say like, you know, you're proof that it does work. And I said, no, it doesn't, that, I'm not proof that it, that it worked. Cause they said, you won. I said, believe me, I didn't, I didn't win by magic, you know? When we fought, and uh, I don't believe in it. I don't believe in the judicial or the political system and all the reform stuff too. Um, you know, partly because I know our history. You know, that, that's part of it. But, uh, and it isn't simply history, it's our reality. See, I wonder a lot of times when I hear people, they talk about, especially like Latino leaders, you know, they talk about police brutality as though it's like, oh yeah, it's over there, you know, somewhere else, you know? Like, oh, it's on the other side of that mountain over there. You know, it's kind of reminds me of Mexico, like, where are the Indians? Oh yeah, they live on, 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 over there by the mountain on the other side. It's like, no, why are, they, why are they looking out there? It's all around us, including in our own community. But, you know, why, why don't we know that? Why isn't that consciousness there? Partly it's, the med partly it's the media, but it's a whole culture of, like you said, keeping that narrative as, uh, you know, as narrow as possible. I, I think they fear is more rebellion, but I think that's. I, th I think the media is doing a good job. I mean, media, the media, you know, the media is privately owned, so like there. But I mean, a place where there's a lot more contention is, is the, the academy, but that's where a lot of the effort to like to minimize the significance of of, of Mexican peoples in the United States is undergoing. It's where that's where it's taking place. I mean, there's you know, I, I it's not a universal thing because obviously you're an academic, but I mean, like, but that's I'm so not, I'm not saying like to a person or whatever, but there is definitely a move afoot. And it, it is, it is being carried out to like say that this is not important. This is not what matters. This is not uh, um, a, a, a. This is a field that is, uh, you know, myopic, outdated. It's it's wrong. It's it's built on uh, false premises. It's it's uh, it's in fact it's very bigoted and uh, itself. And it's it's not a, it's not a form of uh, resistance. It's actually a form of oppression. It's actually colonial. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And just a kind of bizarre statements, um, but. Uh, you know, but it's part of a broader move to just really disallow struggle at a time, at the at at the exact at the precise time when um, when it's becoming one of the most national when it's becoming a, a question of the future of the nation. You know what? I got a radical theory, and I'm going to put it out right now. You know, I was thinking, like the concept of uh, Steve Newcomb talks about the doctrine of discovery. You know, how did they claim the land and on and on and on? And I thought to myself, when you think about the Mexican-American war and you have a treaty and all that, you know, most native people don't, uh, don't abide by that treaty, even though they'll use it if it helps with land claims, you know? But for the most part, the idea is that's a white treaty. It's a government to government treaty, you know? The US government under threat of force forced another country, Mexico, to sign. And then I thought, you know, like most Mexicanos in this country were not born in this country. I mean, you have a huge amount of people. So that means a lot of like someone like myself, I never, I, I never signed that treaty. You know, I never, I didn't give my agreement. In other words, I look at, I could look at it like we're a people, uh, I guess the equivalent of we're like wild savages. Cause that's how they used to talk in the treaty, you know? In other words, I never agree to their terms. I don't agree to their terms, you know? And I just look at it like we're like a, a pueblo 
and resistance at the moment, you know? And you know why I say that? Because when our communities were attacked, nobody came to our defense, you know? We had to fight on our own for the most part. And of course we had a few allies here and there, but I mean, I, I pretty much think that like, um, we, it, well, and you know what I'm talking about? Like you mentioned a second ago about like Mexicans are rapists, etc. Anybody else would have been disqualified from running right there on the spot, you know? But it was like, what, we're, we're, we're like Swiss cheese, right? We don't count, you know? Like a, two years debating whether that was racist or not. <laughs> I swear to God, I, we, 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 like that was, that was, was that racist? I don't know. And then, and then you, get, and you get people from our own community say things like, well, it's not racist because Mexico is not a race. Like, shut the fuck like yeah. oh, oh man and that that's that's like the though that that's the height of it that's our best and brightest <laughs> well imagine if any other group had been singled out in that manner right then at that time you know the, the, you know i i look it couldn't happen but with us it was like and like you say so every time it's us it's kind of like eh, well maybe or oh, well they actually they don't even belong anyway you know there's it's all like subliminal right like so we're not seen as full human beings so i look at it like you know, before I would think of it like maybe we're rebelling in a spiritual sense, but I'm thinking like, I mean, have they given have they given us an option? You know, it's like if we had, you know, a, a unified idea. You know, I guess people would call it a philosophy. You know, you know, maybe something would happen, and that's not saying that it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just that when that's I kind of, you alluded to it earlier. When you push when you push a people, and you step on them. And you act like they're not here or they're disposable. What are people supposed to do? We, they've already told us we don't count. You know, you're not a regular human being. And I look at it like, I don't know. Sometimes we're we're guilty of being too nice. You know, they step on us and like, you know what? Now turn the other cheek. You know. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm pretty much. Uh, well, like I said, I've never believed in this system myself. You know. I think I think I need people. What we need to do is what you were talking about. Is that I know you and I when when uh, when Trump was before the election when was 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 ramping up his rhetoric. You and I had talked about doing something, you know, getting people together and do just at least an analyze and then fell apart for a lot of different reasons. But right, right, right. But what we really should do is like start like some kind of campaign to just get us on television. I just, I mean, like, that's, 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 I know I seem small and petty and like, just like careerist almost sometimes, but like, no, this is really serious. Like somebody, not, not, when I say us, I don't mean you and me. I mean, like, maybe you and me, but like, but like, but, but others, like, like have our, have our qualified people talk on television. Like when something happens and it's about us, we should be on television. Like, <laughs> it was just, you know, like, because well, that's, that's, how, that's how Al Sharpton got on television, you know, jammed them and next thing we got a program. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, Maybe it's messed up, right? But like, but the, you know, the fact of the matter is that like we need to be we need to become part of the national narrative, and like we're just not. I mean, like we're just not. And if you look at like you know one of one of Trump's surrogates, one of the things she attacked was Dora the Explorer. So this tiny little thing that we have, a little foothold that we have beaming to the children of America, is too much. You know, just Dora the Explorer is too much. Yeah, it's too much Mexicans for them. Dora the Explorer. I mean, that, that's ridiculous. Yeah. So we need to fight. I, yeah. Yeah, I, I think part of what we need, that can be like, you know, like you can do things, multi, multiple things at the same time, right? But I, I think part of it is that what I was alluding to. And I think Luis Valdez tried it in the late 60s, early 70s, kind of created the equivalent of a, a Chicano philosophy. You know, he did this poem called Pensamiento Serpentino, you know? And so it's kind of like, you know, something's kind of like that Corky's poem, uh, I am Joaquin. You know, in those days, you know, they had stuff out there and they weren't perfect or anything, but at least people kind of uh, gravitated towards it. And I'm thinking like we're long overdue for something like that. So that when people ask, well, what's, what are you guys fighting for? You know, what are you about? And say, this is what we believe. And I think it's 100% tied into our indigeneity. You see, I think that if you hear, I don't know if you know the scholar Jack Ford, he was like the foremost American Indian scholar. He wrote the book, Aztecas del Norte in 1965 but it got published in 73. He used, to he used to say Mexicans are mestizos, you know? And he says, but so is the rest of the world. Everybody else is mixed, you know? I said, because the people are mixed doesn't mean they're not indigenous, you know? So 
so the idea, and so people use that against us, saying like, oh, they're not native because they're mixed. Like, well, have you ever been to any tribe in this country? Nine out of 10, they're all mixed, you know? You know, most people, you, a lot of people that you see, they're, they're blonde, blue eye, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And nobody says you're not native, but with a Mexican, you have a mixture and it's like, ah, they're not native. And I go, no, so that's what Jack Sport subscribed to. And he actually wrote, in 1962, he wrote, it was called the Mexican Heritage of Aslan, 62. So he believed that Chicanos were native, you know? And I'm saying, and what I'm saying is like, I, I don't think we should be forced, but we should have a process of defining who we are and coming around a philosophy, you know? And I think we've had setbacks, you know, for different reasons, maybe affirmative action, who knows? But I think that's where we got to go. And, what, and when we're there, you know, we have the right to do whatever we want. And I don't know what that is yet, but I think we are at the point where we have the right to do that. Included with that is what you're talking about, you know? In other words, we can do that and have exposure on television. Because to me, you know, I'm doing right now, I'm calling it the Archives Project, you know, for, I mentioned it earlier, 20, what was it, the year 2014 to 2020, all the killings, you know? It's like, how many know, you know, whenever I hear Eric Garner or Tamir Rice, I'm like, God, there's a, there's a Chicano or a Native person that got killed the exact same way at the exact same time but you never hear it from the national, you know, it doesn't matter who, right? Uh, well, whoever's got the mic, you know, never. And I'm saying that's kind of what we need to do. It goes along with what you're talking about. Let's look at the black community, right? The, black, the African-American community, like George Floyd, that was on television. Mike Brown, that was on television. Trayvon Martin, that was on television, right? Now you have a case like Elijah Carter, not on television. So it's not, there's not as big, a, there's a response, but not as big a response. Like, you know, the, the, like, you know uh, black people are killed by the cops all the time, but the time there's usually like momentum is yeah. when it becomes a national story and the whole country's talking about it. Yeah. And then there's momentum that becomes something bigger, right? And so like, I, I'm not saying it's a creation of the media at all, but I'm saying there oftentimes other times when black people are killed and it's not on television, then it's not this thing that the entire country is talking about. They'll talk about it in, in the neighborhood, in the town. It'll be something that we fight for there, like Easel Ford here in LA. All different things like that, but like when it when it when it's put on the national forefront, it becomes a national story, and that right. just doesn't happen for us. I mean, it happened in El Paso, but nobody knows the names of the twenty people that got shot in El Paso. So I mean, like it's, just, it's not, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, I, I and I don't know how to do that because I you know I I got my eyes open. And I know there's a few people out there that they could, but it's rare, like you're saying, because like Domingo Garcia out of uh, the president of LULAC, mm -hmm. like they've interviewed him a few times, you know. Someone like him, you know, but it's like if there's a hundred interviews, he might be one out of a hundred. He should be maybe part of 10 of them, you know. There's a woman out of, uh, is it Texas? I think it's uh, the one that's called, I think it's called Voto Latino. She comes out on MSNBC. And then there's the project that got uh, Ocasio. I forget the name of the project, but there's a young woman that heads it. She's awesome. So there's a few, but you know, it would have to be a huge project that says like, wait a minute, like you're talking about demographics, you know? Like, why is it we have 1% instead of 18, you know? Right, exactly. You know? Yeah, yeah. So look, we, need to, we need that. And I don't know how, how that's gonna happen, but we do need it. Well, I'm just saying though, is if, there, if we were part of the national narrative, it would be a lot, or, it'd, be, it'd be easier to organize. It would be yeah. easier to organize in Pilsen if we were part of the national nor, or narrative. It would be easier to organize in Albuquerque. If we were yeah. part of the national narrative. It would be easier to organize in Tucson. It'll be easier to organize in Los Angeles. It'll be easier to organize all over the country around issues that affect us directly if we were part of the national narrative and everybody had in their brain, oh yeah. shit, we're part of the national narrative. And it would, it would like create the, that, that kind of scenario for other people as well. Like, yes, this is part of the country I live in. Part of the country I live in is defined by the Mexican-American war. People don't have that consciousness. It's true, but people don't have that consciousness. You know what right. I mean? But you think about, you think about like, everybody knows they have the right to remain silent. Everybody knows they have a right to an attorney. People might even know they have Miranda rights, but they have no idea who Ernesto Miranda was. And they have no idea about the case Miranda versus Arizona. You know what I mean? They have no idea. But that came from a case of a Mexicano. They, they, they don't know that. Nobody yeah. knows that. So like, you know, like, and that affects everyone. That's not like a Chicano study 101 and just that for us, or that, that affects everybody. Your Miranda rights affect everybody and nobody knows this information. Well, you know, one, one thing I could tell you too is like, I've seen, I've seen white people post on the YouTube Mm -hmm. And they'll say, like, they get tough with the border patrol, you know, white people. Mm -hmm. 
And then they post it on YouTube and say, see, that's how you resist, you know? And I, I look at it like, these guys, are they for reals? In other words, that's a white person doing that. A Mexican or a black person can't do that to law enforcement, you know? <laughs> In other words, there's the reality of the streets, you know? And what I've seen, you know, because I know all, all the laws, right? I know, like you said, the Miran, everything. But on the streets, it's like a cop can kill you and you can win in court, you know, the, the family can win in court, but you're dead, you know. And so, in other words, it's a system of control. People know, you know, you act up, you have the right to act up, <laughs> but a cop can kill you, you know, or brutalize you. And so that's how they've kept it all these years. I think ever since uh, Michael Brown, for sure, but maybe even a little bit before, it's like there's been an explosion of shootings by cops. In the old days, it, it was like, the, the gun was the last resort. You know, they would use their sticks, you know, the riot stick, and they would kill too. But I think now it's like almost all the videos that I've seen, they, they get out of their car, weapons drawn, you know, and they have contact. Look, Tamir Rice was two seconds, but they have contact with somebody within seconds, boom. They're either tasering, beanbag, or just outright shooting and killing. I mean, you don't really hear any more about people because almost everybody I grew up, they would tell me, yeah, no, the cop beat me up. You know, they, they worked, you know, they did them in big time. But now it's like, it's shoot first, you know? And uh, no, that's why I don't stop about this topic. You know, I imagine when I was younger, I thought that this would be over with by now. It got worse. Yeah, yeah it, it's really bad. But I tell you, one thing I'm proud about is a lot of the, like the justice family, they're young. And that, that wasn't there before, but they're, they're there now. But you know, what I don't like is our spiritual health, our mental health, because it's tough to get up in public, you know, and to fight. Um, and I, cause you know, people talk in public and they talk in private and in private, oh, it hurts them, you know? You know, to recount, you know, to relive the trauma of the, you know, the mother, the, the father, the daughter, whomever that gets killed, to relive that over and over and over, it's hard. But, you know, people do it because it's like, we don't have a choice, you know? Yeah, so th thanks for what you did on your book. I don't know how much more time we have or if we're done, but. Oh, no, I mean, we're, 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 we're uh, we, can, we can wrap it up. Uh, appreciate that you, that you enjoyed the book. And I just want to be like real clear about what I'm saying about the media. I'm just, I'm not saying that we need a piece of the media so that we can be like media stars or <laughs> part of, you know, like where, but the question, it's just a question of like, we have to like beam a national to the national consciousness that we're like a, that we're here that we there were people that live here work here die here um and that's known but it's treated as insignificant and that has to end that has yeah. to end because because it's making it so that we not only are we oppressed but we don't even have the we don't we lack the consciousness to organize against our oppression and that's yeah. largely because we're not part of the national narrative we're not allowed to be and so like we really have to fight to become that and i believe in like creating independent streams of of of, of media you know creating our own you know version outside of that i absolutely believe in that right um but but it's also there also has to be you know we also have to be part of this thing that everyone else is part of you know like and and, and we have to have we have to be there and uh, we have to be present and that has to happen well, yeah it's kind of like what the idea of like being at the table you know we're not at the table right now you know, and I think that's necessary. That's the minimum, you know, that when we're talking about, see, if we were in the 1950s, that'd be different, you know, but we're not in the 1950s anymore. Yeah. So if we're talking about eliminating racism, doing away with police brutality, well, we have to be there, you know? And this notion, cause see some of the, some of that, my observation, some of the younger ones accept the idea of like, oh, we'll be there to support or we'll be allies. And I'm like, wait a minute, this issue affects you also directly. That means you are co-equal. So you go in as comrades, not as like, you know, silent and invisible, you know, or like a backup army. No, no, we, we are co-equal and we need to do that. You know, and, and how could people accept any less? Because imagine, yeah, it, it's just, to me, that's just a bizarre idea. Cause like I said, I didn't grow up with that. You know, the, the era of the Black Panthers, you know, that, people were co-equal, you know, either you were in on the struggle or you were not, you know? And if you were not, then that, you're, you're the enemy, you know? Yeah. But in terms of us fighting together, that was that was a given. And I think we need to see that, but I think we're, we're being silenced and invisibilized 
and we are except we ourselves are accepting that. And I don't think we should. But right. absolutely, we have to be comrades, you know, because like I said, it, the opposite would be to say like we're enemies. We're not enemies. You know? what, I, what I just mean to say, what, and the other thing is that you talk about like build, uh, uh, having a seat at the table, but also, we also like, you know, so since we're denied a seat at the table, we end up building our own table. And not even like a lot of the fights I find myself in are people who say it is wrong to build your own table when you're not allowed at this other table. And like, that's a fight oh, I'm going to win every time. I mean, I have no, I have no issues with it. <laughs> But like, you know, I don't lose fights, but like, but like, so like, that's kind of, you know, whatever, but like, uh, you know, it only goes so far if, if, if it's just these things that we're creating. So we, we really have to, the hooker by crook, we have to, be, we have to find ways to communicate with one another. No, but, it, but it's a great idea because I, I used to use a similar analogy because, you know, people would talk about like the stage, you know, like who's on the stage. I said, well, why don't we create our own? You know, let's create our own stage. You know, it's like, you see, like in the world of the academy, that, that's where, see, this is, this is what I learned in like indigenous thinking. You know, my wife and I, we were recruited by native intellectuals from being writers. They recruited us to go to University of Wisconsin. And we were schooled by and trained by native scholars. And I'll tell you the difference between Chicano scholars and native scholars in terms of what I'm gonna tell you right now. Um, I think, the academy is used to ping pong. That is, your oppressors, or in this case, say white capitalists, etc. You know, they tell you what's up, and we we ping pong. We say no, and then you know, it's like a ping pong match. You know, back and forth, back and forth. Indigenous scholars were like, okay, we've arrived. It's time for you to go home. You know, it's bedtime. Go go. You know, go go play with yourself. You know what I mean? In other words, our philosophy, who we are, is not dependent upon what they're telling us. We don't need to play ping pong with them, you know? Like, again, go to sleep, you know? So this is how I think, you know? I go, we don't need to uh, play on their stage, you know? Or like you say, be at their table. We, if they're forcing us in this manner, you know, if they put us at the table, that'd be different. But they've acted as though we don't exist, you know? And so now it's like, well, we're gonna, I think as a community, we have, right, we have that right. And I don't want to predetermine anything, but like, I would, I didn't think we were going to be here, you know, 50 years ago, but here we are, invisible and silenced, you know? So I think we have that right to step forward, you know? And it, and it, and there could be a lot of battles and all that, but, you know, I think people should be conscious, like, who are our real enemies, you know? Yeah. You know we, we literally are, are seen as the enemy, you know? And, yeah, I, t I, t I don't know. I got really disappointed in, like, say, in 2016, 2015, you know? You know, we're derided, you know, demeaned, dehumanized. And people, like you say, they're still debating whether they're racist against us. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Well, not enough time, man. We should, I mean, I'm, I don't know if you've done it before, but you got to have a little more time on your book. Well, I mean, like, uh, we can schedule another one, but... Uh... Let's, 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 let's call it a wrap today, but like... Uh, no, no, yeah. So, I mean, like, do one for yourself, you know, because it'd be awesome for people to hear more on your book. Yeah, yeah, well, okay. Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, I, mean, I can't interview myself, though. I mean, so... <laughs> somebody asked me questions, you know. <laughs> oh, but, well, maybe we could arrange something, right? All right, let's, let's talk about it. All right, well, thanks for everything. Thank you so much for your time, and, uh, and uh, we'll be talking soon, I'm sure. Okay, that's right.